When we're mad enough, we warm up. It's where we get the term hot with rage. This is due to adrenaline, which increases blood flow and warms us up to be ready for battle. It's one of the reasons I hate being a mammal. I run hot. Our cooling mechanisms are pretty nifty. We can sweat. Many other animals cannot. A study from many years ago looked into one of the possible mechanisms non-avian dinosaurs used to stay cool thanks to analysis of modern archosaurs. Their adaptations were quite a bit different than what we got going on. The topic of how the dinosaurs reached their physiological needs is complicated and controversial. Were they cold-blooded, warm-blooded, something in between? This video will not delve deeply into this topic as it deals with a very specific technique used by specific groups of dinosaurs to keep their heads cool. Basic middle or high school biology may teach you that the differences between metabolisms include warm and cold-blooded animals. However, like with every single topic in biology, the reality is far more complicated. There are now around 15 terms that are helpful to know the basic definitions of in order to have a general understanding of how complicated reality is. So, you may remember ectotherm and endotherm. Broadly, an ectothermic animal is one that cannot control the temperature inside its body. These animals require heat from external sources. An endothermic animal is the opposite. They generate their own internal body temperatures through various processes. A relatively newer term is mesotherm. Mesothermic animals are technically capable of producing their own internal body temperatures, but not as strongly as endotherms and tend to have rather slow metabolisms. Examples include leatherback sea turtles, tuna, and echidnas. Homeothermy refers to internal temperatures that remain the exact same always, and heterothermy is the opposite. A poikilothermic animal is one that has constantly changing internal body temperature and can be ecto or endothermic at the same time. The reason this term is more often used to refer to animals like reptiles and amphibians these days is because there are some ectothermic animals that seek a constant source of external energy, so they end up being homeothermic. If we want to be real sticklers for terminology, there's also stenotherms, animals that can only exist in a specific and rather narrow range of temperatures. Its opposite is called a eurytherm and can include animals that are extremophiles. Tardigrades, for example, can exist in virtually every environment. Okay, now that you know these terms, we can proceed. I just want you to know that if I refer to something as warm or cold-blooded, I do not literally mean that their blood is cold or warm to the touch. Instead, it's a generic common term that better describes a metabolism or how well an animal is able to generate, use, and keep energy. Whether or not the dinosaurs were endotherms, ectotherms, mesotherms, poikilotherms, or whatever combination of the terms I already went over, these animals did share a suite of characteristics within their skeletons and their family tree that suggest they were far closer to the endotherm side of the spectrum than the ectotherm side. Unlike them are their living relatives, the crocodilians. Dinosaurs, as you may know, sprouted from seemingly crocodilian-like ancestors known as archosaurs. Alongside them were the ancestors to the true crocodilians we see today. The living crocodilians are ectothermic poikilotherms. This means, in order to warm up their internal body temperature to perform daily biological tasks, they must first absorb that energy from the surrounding environment in the form of direct solar radiation or indirectly from sun-heated objects. Dinosaurs are diapsids. This term refers to the number of holes in the skull. Aside from the nostrils and eye sockets, there are holes behind the eyes and one in front with varying uses. 
It was traditionally thought that dinosaur jaw muscles attached to the lower jaw and then shot straight up into the holes of the back of the skull. At that point, the muscles were thought to invade the bony holes and fill them up completely, like the rippling pair of muscles on the back of a pit bull's head. These were assumed to have allowed the group a stronger bite. The group of scientists charged with investigating this previously accepted hypothesis, which included Casey Holliday, William Porter, Ken Villette, and Larry Whitmer, found something a little different. In their 2020 work, published in the anatomical record, they took CT scans, MRI data, and combined it with observational data and dissections to look for any signs of how the muscles of the jaw attach to the roof of the skull. Casey Holliday stated, It's really weird for a muscle to come up from the jaw, make a 90 degree turn, and go along the roof of the skull. This is what got the study going in the first place. We now have a lot of compelling evidence for blood vessels in this area, based on our work with alligators and other reptiles, he stated. Over 100 taxa were sampled, living and extinct. Compiling the data gave a new outlook on the top of the skull of not only non-avian dinosaurs, but their archosaurian ancestors as well, and therefore, most of the other lineages of the archosaurian group like pterosaurs, notosuchians, and the true crocodilians. The two holes of a diapsid skull are called the temporal fenestrae. In dinosaurs, there is also a third hole in front of the eye which housed sinuses and may have helped conserve weight. The hole in front of the eye socket is called the antorbital fenestrae. The bottommost hole in the skull behind the eye is called the lateral temporal fenestrae because in most dinosaurs, the topmost hole moved around to rest at the top of the skull roof. In this case, the hole is now called the dorsal temporal fenestrae. It is this hole the researchers found in all groups except mammals and birds. Birds still have the second hole in the skull, but it migrated down to be with the other hole and is used in jaw musculature. Mammals, of course, don't have the second hole, being synapsids, but they do have a large opening near the top of the skull. Within the dorsal temporal fenestrae, the holes on the skull roof of dinosaurs, lizards, archosaurs, and crocodilians also have a depression at the front of it called a dorsal temporal fossa. A fossa is basically just this part of the skull that creates a little funnel-like shelf area at the front part of the hole while the entire hole itself, including the rim made of bone, is called the fenestra. Within the large dorsal temporal fenestrae are two beveled shelves of bone, which help to create a surface for muscles and other soft tissue to attach to from below. Jaw muscles anchored to the lower jaw eat through the bone up to this point. Shelves of bone in this hole are referred to as fossae. Specifically, the one at the back is the dorsal temporal fossa, or DT fossa, and the frontmost shelf is the frontoparietal fossa, or FPF. The original interpretation of this region in dinosaurs had muscles invading the entire fenestral hole, with the muscles attaching to both the FPF and DTFOS, which would make the whole contraption one massive muscular unit attaching to the lower jaw. However, as Casey Holliday stated, it would be anatomically unusual for an animal to have musculature that extends that far, as they did not find that type of condition in any other related groups. Instead, modern crocodilians, the closest living relatives to the dinosaurs, have a mass of fatty tissue and blood vessels on the dorsal temporal fossa, or FPF. Modern crocodilians use this mass of fat and blood vessels to keep their heads nice and cool. This works as a temperature regulation technique because the animals are ectothermic and need to gain heat from the environment or lose it quickly when overheated or chilled. The researchers of the new study went to their local zoo with thermal imaging devices to observe the way in which crocodilians lose and gain heat. They found the area of the head, which houses the dorsal temporal fossa and fenestrae FPF, was exceptionally warm when the animal began to warm itself up in the sun and became far chillier than the rest of the animal when it needed to cool off. This occurs because the blood vessels are closer to the outside world at this point on the head than on other points of the animal's body, which means it's easier for that part to lose heat and gain heat than the rest of the animal. I can't help but think this has something to do with protecting the brain from overheating or getting a brain freeze as well. 
the fenestrae and fossae, as well as the skeletal correlates to the fat and blood vessel deposits, were found most prominently in the non-avian theropod and ceratopsian dinosaurs, plus the pterosaurs and the assortment of weird crocodilian-like archosaurs and the true crocodilians. This had wider connotations to the study of dinosaurs if this hypothesis stands up to future scrutiny, as it adds another caveat to the endotherm-ectotherm debate on dinosaurian physiology. Tyrannosaurs were looked at as just one of the many data points for the study, including an adult tyrannosaurus and a juvenile, or nanotyrannus. These dinosaurs had rather large windows on top of their skulls and likely had the same structure seen in the crocodilians. If the giant tyrannosaurs were true warm-blooded endotherms, then these structures would have helped the animals keep their heads at the right temperature, no matter the amount of food they were digesting to keep their internal body temperature at the right gradient. If the giant tyrannosaurs were not true endotherms, instead using a form of ectothermy called gigantothermy, these structures would have helped them in much the same way as crocodilians. Gigantothermy is a metabolic technique in which the organism is technically an ectotherm, getting its internal body heat from the environment, but is so large that it generates heat just from existing. Moving and digesting creates heat, and the bigger you are, the more heat that generates. If you're a 9-ton predator of the Hell Creek Formation, gigantothermy might be a good solution, as it would allow you to be nearly as active as a true endotherm, without the extreme need for sustenance. I'll delve more into gigantothermy at another time. Then again, there is evidence suggesting that modern crocodilians are extremely bizarre among their peers. Considering crocs have four-chambered hearts like their bird and non-bird dino cousins, a limb posture in between sprawling and upright, multi-chambered lungs with unidirectional airflow, also like their bird cousins, a diaphragmaticus muscle allowing for powerful breathing while running despite a low metabolic rate, and rapidly growing highly vascularized fibrolamellar bone seen only in birds and mammals. It's safe to say the evidence is strongly in favor of these animals evolving from high metabolism animals. On top of that, the skeletal anatomy of many non-crocodilian archosaurs suggests they were far more endothermic than crocodilians. All of this is to say that it is highly unlikely that any dinosaur was anywhere near ectothermy. However, I could still see some giant sauropods doing what crocs did and adapting to an ectothermic type of metabolism if they lived in a constantly warm environment and were constantly digesting food. The dorsotemporal air conditioning structure prevalent in theropods may have correlations to the crests and lumps seen on the faces of many of these carnivorous dinosaurs. The enormous crests of dinosaurs like Guanlong or Dilophosaurus may therefore have had more than one function to attract mates, to signal to other animals, and to gain and release heat quickly. Only time will tell. What anatomical marvels, previously held idea-breaking discoveries, or morphological mysteries might be found on the cutting edge of dinosaur science? For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, like this video, drop a comment in the comment section below, and hit the bell icon to stay in the know with everything Edge. Thanks for watching.